the golden thread evocatively woven into the fabric of our souls only now and then appears in this vast tapestry of days and years how resplendently it shines forth when we are shaken by the truly marvelous a glimpse of what we are transforms our fears an intuition of ourselves in another greater place a larger room a loftier climb perhaps our supernal home appears because there are moments in life when you see this reality of things and there are moments when you really get a glimpse of a, the main pattern of life and it's sort of a golden thread you when you're inspired to paint you have it you have it when you're in love there are moments when you have it and that's the golden thread to me I can't remember a time when I didn't draw one day I was sitting around the t table with my, I was about seven I guess I was sitting around the dining room table with my father and my father looked at me and said why is it baby he always called me baby babe why is it that you always make sketches of faces why do you always do faces and I said well daddy if I put a couple of eyes down I've got a companion right away <laughs> well, I always have all kind of stories to myself I was living in Paris and I was coming home and yeah anything that looked like a big flat book that looked like a portfolio <laughs> I like to carry anything like that. <laughs> Clara Snyder was a wonderful teacher in, uh, in Memphis, it's a high, in high school, Central High, and she was very good. But I do remember this good friend of mine coming after school and posing in a bathing suit. For that reason, I was almost sent out, put out of high school because they said, <laughs> because I had to learn something about anatomy, you know, and all that kind of thing. Oh, I had a lot of experiences like that, pretty funny experiences. My mother wanted me to be a fashion, interested in fashion, because and my mother was really very creative with clothes. She was very creative. She was a musician. She played the piano, sang. She was very, very creative. She really wanted me to, you know, do something in music. And she used to say, you know, don't pick up a pencil till you practice you know she say to me I come home from school and she say you know don't pick up a pencil till you practice and that's really bad psychology because if she'd said practice before you picked up a pencil then I'd pick up <laughs> then I would probably would have you know done something else my family they were very uh, business minded people my mother was autistic my father was very business minded they were interested in me being a commercial artist. It definitely was. That was year 35 or something like that. And I went to Europe that year, and I was over there for about five months, long time with my mother. We went all around, and I saw the marvelous, went into the museums, really for the first time, because we, you know, didn't have that much in Memphis at the time that we have now. And I went to all these marvelous places. I went to the Uffizi, and I was told to pronounce Uffizi as someone who's lived in Italy a long time. Uffizi in Florence, and I was in Milan, I was uh, in Venice, and there was a wonderful Venice, a wonderful Titian exhibition in Venice at the time. It was marvelous. Great Titian show. Oh. And there was a wonderful lot of everything, and going to the Louvre, in Paris, and going to all, and then I just was so amazed and so thrilled with everything. When I came back, I wasn't really for any commercial work. I wanted to go into a, and I went into a man by the name of Mr. Getch in, in St. Louis, and I went into his painting class. That was the end. End of all the fashion in my life. It was completely over with. I started to 
pain. And that's the beginning was St. Louis. I went to one year of the audience and it was terribly cold. In Chicago. Yeah, yeah. And I had a history of art teacher with Helen Gardner who did the art through the ages. Helen Gardner was your art history yeah, she teacher? Was an art history teacher. Grand Al Dom of Art History Textbooks. Well, um, what year was that? Do you remember what year that was? It's been the 30s somewhere. In the 30s? In the 30s. It seems to me that we did everything that first year. You had a little bit of everything. everything. Yeah. Kind of an introduction yeah, to everything. Everything. And I don't remember having a new model. I don't remember having a model. Oh. I don't even remember drawing from the model. I don't know at that period. I don't remember that. But um, Helen Gardner must have been impressive then because you remembered her. Yeah, she, but she was fine. <laughs> well, I was working with, with Robert Brackman. And I remember that we had to get there very early to get a good place. And I used to laugh and say, I won't pay till I see the whites of their eyes. It, if you didn't come early at Brackman's class, it was such a big class, you couldn't get a good view of the model. It was just impossible. It was a big class. I learned everything that I really learned from him. But I didn't, I, I didn't say that I didn't learn things from, well, entirely different when I started with the abstract and the space and the move in the back of the Hoffman and the push-pull and all the things in the abstract world. But as far as painting a figure, figure painting and portraits, he couldn't have been a better teacher to teach to paint a portrait. From dark to light, and it was a very logical precision. I mean, you know, a painting, drawing from the, pa from the drawing to the painting to realistic painting. It was very, very logical. And I still use it when I you know, do a figure or something. I still use that. And then I learned from, to draw from, with a brush. You start with a pencil, start with a brush. You do everything with a brush. It's a way to do it. I didn't work with in the abstract until I got close to Vitlachil. Vitlachil was a very good, he was a, worked with Hoffman, you know, and he was at, that was a year that Adele Lem and I went to uh, Martha's Vineyard, worked with Vitlachil. But he was the abstract painter, began to make me feel the work abstractly. Yeah, he was one way. He was a pupil of Hoffman's, and uh, yeah, Hoffman's. So he was very abstract. I met Betty Parsons in Malta's Vineyard, as a matter of fact. So the first memory I have of, of her with a seagull flying overhead. <laughs> she was one of the enzymes in the dough of abstract expressionism. A gallery like no other gallery in New York brought together diverse creative personalities and from everywhere they gravitated toward her like steel to a magnet, Japan, Spain, America, England. There was a lady there that introduced me to Betty. She, she, I had some watercolors in, the, uh, in a show down in the, uh, the place where Fiddle Chill, you know, his had, students. had his student exhibits and things. And uh, it seems that uh, she was interested in so this friend that had a studio in Martha's Vineyard that was studying with Fit too. Uh -huh. Introduced Betty, Betty to, me. to you. What compelled you to go back to New York? And when was that? Uh, well, I was married for three years and a uh, year. And then I got a divorce and I went back and I felt it was necessary to go back. I worked about a year. And I was working in New York, and I just had a show. And she said she wanted to give me a show, and I said, "Well, that's wonderful." And I just had a show. I had the first show, and it was pretty abstract, and it was very, very, very pale. And I was doing all these very, very pale things, very pale, because it was shown in Betty's, you know, three or four of those, and they were all hanging, you know, on silk and everything watercolors, very, very diaphanous, very pale and moving back and forth. Thing. 
They were completely abstract, very abstract. But I hear quote a letter from Betty Parsons when she received my cacamonas. She was quite a poet herself. Your cacamonas sonnets, she calls them, cacamona sonnets arrived, and they are beautiful, like words remembered but vanished with silence and light. She was a very good poet, a very poetic woman, very. I was scared as hell. I just remember one very interesting incident of that show. There were those cacamona things were hanging on a on a they were hanging on a curtain in the Betty Parsons gallery. And she had a lot of paintings behind there, you know. Jackson Pollock, before it opened, it was before it opened, he came and he had to take my paintings off the wall, no, off the curtain on the opening. And that really was something to get back to show the people in the modern museum his work. <laughs> that was really, that stood out. I thought there was a lot of chicanery and a lot of things going on at the time. In this period, which started in the late 30s and early 40s, Europe began to look to America for the first time for ins new inspiration. This had never happened before in the history of art. The painter of this period played constantly with the accident and the unconscious as a valid expression, and it was nurtured and causing cause to, the, to the ultra extreme. The usual center of interest was dispersed with, and a picture seemed to go beyond the limits of the canvas. This type of painting, although it inspired and encouraged the creative person to a great extent, it, it let down the bars to a type of chicanery and invited also the slick and the clever. Yet a bad a pretense of an abstract painting is no worse than a bad academic painting. See, after the world, First World War, when all these European artists came to New York, you know, it was a whole new world of, of all of art. But this New York was full of wonderful artists, you know, different artists. Well, they were all that group that, uh, that made history. I met all of them, Ad Reinhardt and all the bunch, and Pollock. Well, I remember whenever, when there was a Pollock show going on in New York, the elevators were just everything, you know, people just, yeah, you know, vibrated to it, to the whole thing. That was something. And when there was an opening, it was pretty exciting. It was a pretty exciting time to be in New York. He was very quiet. Which one? Pollock. He never talked very much. I thought Rothko was the best of the whole group. I was mad about Rothko. He reminded me of a rabbi or something. He was very, you know, sort of very quiet. And I met him in the, he was having a show in the Museum of Modern Art. And I said, you're probably something, one of the greatest colorists in the world. And he said, what do you mean probably? You know, he sounded really a big, big ego sort of thing. The men, we went out one time with about I had Ryan Hart and a few other guys, and we sat there and he said, hey, you're one of them, you're wild. <laughs> he said to me, you're one of us, you're wild. Oh my that was God, supposed to be great. a great, that was a great compliment. So you're uh -huh. wild. I don't think I was influenced by anybody up there at that time. I wasn't influenced, but I was uh, st terribly stimulated. I was enormously stimulated. There was so much to see. There was so much that I thought was not real, too. I always thought there was a lot of things that were not, that didn't really strike me as being really felt. I thought a lot of superfluous things were going on, too, that I didn't think were that important, that people were making a lot about. And I was thinking it was not, is this real? Is this, what is this? You know, that kind of stuff. But I was very open to it everything. I was really open all the time. But they always were fighting the women in the gallery. Betty Parsons was having a hard time with the... They always wanted to kick the women out. And she'd say, well, I'm a woman and I'm not going to have some women painters. You know, they were always kind of fighting them. I didn't like the atmosphere in the, for that reason. 
And I, I used to go into the Christian Science Reading Room like somebody going into a bomb shelter. I used to feel the atmosphere was so thick in New York City at that time that you wanted to get over it. Really, you could feel it if you were sensitive. And God knows I've been too sensitive all my life. Lord, that was so true. Sometimes you just felt like, I've got to get out of this place. I've got to get out of here. It's just too much. I had been in New York and I had been so excited about everything that was going on in New York. And Betty Parsons was really the Promethean fire, but she didn't say go and start on today. She just was so full of everything that was going on that she, she just lit me like some people light you with yeah. something. And I came down to Memphis and there wasn't anything going on. It was absolutely nothing. Del Lamb, Dorothy Stern, and uh, Mildred Hudson. But she was a director of the Art Academy at the time. Well, Nancy was a sculptor, Glazer. There was one thing I held against Nancy. I could have had a, Betty Parsons would have had a, would have sold me a Rothko for the museum, but they would have had to buy it on time. Museum and, and Nancy Glazer said, a museum shouldn't buy anything on time. If the Brooks could have had a Rothko. But you all raised the money to buy those first paintings. Oh, oh well, we did. Yeah. We raised everything. Every penny. I begged and ran around. Mrs. Gooch was the first one to give me any money. And I thought when somebody gave me a hundred dollars, it was just wonderful. I just think it needed it. It really did need it, didn't it? Because we didn't have anything of all you think was going on in New York at that time, really. And I remember what fun, the Marie Taylor from St. Louis and went around looking at that first show, uh, St. Louis Collects was a show, and that was so exciting going around to the Pulitzer Collection. That was the first Art Today show. And we had a wonderful, and they were all probably from Joseph Pulitzer. Really all from the, and that was wonderful going around Picking up that stuff in St. Louis was exciting. I feel sorry for Louise Clark. I bet she went through hell when people came to that Brooks for that first show. She was open for everything, but I think she was probably scared to death when we had that first St. Louis Collect show. People would come in and probably drive her crazy, you know what I mean? She, she had a lot of trouble, you know. I mean, I think she must have had to be very brave, you know, with all the stuff she had to put up with. You know, people would be coming and probably mortified at some of the things. When I have outrun time and the cacophony of the flesh, will my identity be intact in the region of hell or in the gardens of paradise? Will I know another by a touch or a cry, a long embrace or a wretched sigh? In the eons of loneliness between one morning and the next, is there only a recognition of our being within another's caress? Golden and crimson rain, rhythmically, serenely, silent music and cosmic ballet, Oh, that my passage might be in such breathless majesty. 